Chapter 361 Pocket Rift Reality Relay Station Pocket Dimension Between Mirror Reality 34 and Real WORLD The old mage stationed at the tower had not slept. His flowing beard was a twisted mess, which he had nervously filled with as he paced around the room. He had sent a high-priority message orb to the mirror reality, but he doubted it reached a target. N0V3LTR0V served as the original host for this chapter's release on N0V3 Leaders B1N. The three windows on the tower, the bridges between worlds, were unstable and flickering in and out of existence. Taking some precautions, he had burned his notes, his papers and every other document. The new window appearing was becoming more tangible, its edges and frame had manifested into physical objects, while the one to the mirror reality was fading, and even disappeared for a few fractions of each second that passed. But the old mage could do nothing. He had only one warp charge to power the tower, and its swirling energies were slowing and failing. Every so often, the mage glanced at the window to the real world. The temptation to save himself and leave was strong, but that would use up the last of the warp charge. Without power, the tower would sever its connection to the mirror reality, causing a ribbon that would destabilize it further, and lead to its collapse all matter, beings, and thoughts inside would cease to exist. The mage knew he wouldn't sacrifice so many just to save himself, but the impulse to escape kept calling to him, luring him in. Each time he glanced at the window he had to steal himself, he clenched his fists, shook his head and solidified his resolve. He sat down by his fireplace and took a deep swig of his drink as he watched the dancing flames. This ancient tower will become my last abode. May its walls become my silent witness, preserving a testament to my final duty. Letting the window fade was preferable to severing the connection, and he would make sure it did just that. But as he gazed into the consuming flames, another idea tiptoed into his mind. He lightly tapped his fingers on his armrest, then lightly beat his fist, then finally gripped the chair and pushed himself up gritting his teeth as he committed himself to the idea. He rushed down the stairs and retrieved the warp charge from its pedestal. The pedestal held some of its energy for a moment, and he rushed back upstairs before it powered down. The new window, the one to an unknown world, seemed to respond and materialize completely. However, as he looked through, there was only an abyss of darkness. He brought the warp charge near, and cracks began to form on the unknown window. He glanced back to the mirror reality window. Without the warp charge powering the pedestal downstairs, it was fading quickly, and was about to disappear. Nothing came through the unknown window, but it began to fill with cracks. Something was pushing it through, ignoring all the consequences of shattering the window. The old mage's eyes widened in shock, and paused for a moment. But something in the depths of his mind drove him to move again, and he quickly moved to the unknown window. His hands filled with mana as he cast his spell, each fingertip glowing blue. The tower was becoming a bridge between the real world and the unknown, as the window began to shatter. The frame started to warp and bend. The snowstorm outside stopped its howling roar. The pure silence was only filled by a deep breath from the old mage. Peering out the only window he could see through, he saw that the snow had stopped falling suspended in the air. Outside the tower, time stood still. I think you should take a look at. He had almost finished his spell. The warp charge began to hum and crackle violently. The window to the unknown gave way, leaving only an endless void. Something made of immaterial pure nothingness seeped out. As it met the material world it began to morph and change, first it to the form of a tentacle, then the tentacle grew fingers, then claws. You're too late. The old mage growled. The void of nothingness didn't understand, much less comprehend as he came closer to finishing his spell. But after a moment, it sounded back, echoing his voice. You're too late. The voice growled back from the abyssal void, sounding like his own voice, but filled with deeper and waving undertones of disembodied souls. The void of darkness seeping through kept changing and morphing, and slowly turned into a humanoid shape, similar to the old man's body. It was copying him in every respect. Strangely, his void shape began to inch closer to the warp charge. The old mage clenched his jaw, defiance etched upon his face as he ignored the creature and the relentless pressure building within him. With searing pain that shot through his veins, he summoned every ounce of his dwindling strength, pushing the warp charge beyond instability and into the realms of madness. He shattered the fragile barrier that held the warp charge in, unleashing a cataclysmic surge of unimaginable power. Reality quivered, its fragile tapestry rent and torn. The fabric of time, material, and space twisted and contorted, wailing in protest against the imminent rupture. 
The very air crackled with anticipation, charged with arcane energies that defied comprehension as they tried to mix with reality. Then, with an ear-splitting detonation, the energies exploded. The tower convulsed and waved as if it were a ribbon caught within the throes of a celestial storm. Colors blended and swirled, warping into hues unseen by mortal eyes. Fractured fragments of alternate dimensions bleated into existence, colliding with one another in a symphony of chaos. Gravity wavered, tugging at reality's seams, as if unsure where its allegiance lay. Pockets of swirling energy materialized, becoming portals to realms unknown. The boundaries of time warp, looping upon themselves in intricate patterns that defied logic. Spatial distortions stretched and snapped, creating fractures where the very laws of existence crumbled. Fleeting glimpses of forgotten worlds, ethereal apparitions of creatures long extinct, all-seeing gazes of eldritch horrors, and whispers of forgotten secrets, danced upon the fringes of perception. The old mage stood at the epicenter of this primordial storm of everything and nothing, his very essence intertwined with the unleashed energies. He was a conduit, a vessel of unbridled might that transcended mortal limitations. The weight of his actions, the price he paid, resonated through every fiber of his being as it tore him apart. With a deafening roar, the fabric of this pocket reality began to crumble. The walls that had once stood strong now disintegrated into swirling mists of fading existence. Time and space twisted and folded in on themselves, creating a disorienting maze of fragmented corridors and shifting landscapes of snow and mountains. Then finally, the pocket dimension collapsed, leaving behind nothing but the void. Chapter 362 Stalkers W-I-L-D-E-R-N-E-S-S -S. Three bounty hunters hung to the tree line at the edge of a vast expanse of jagged rocks and boulders, all covered in a thick carpet of moss. What do you think? Link asked, squinting out over the naked plain. There's no way around. Vanderby whispered, looking left and right, then back at some boulders in front of them, and he tilted his head forward, but I don't like that. Two giant boulders lay a hundred yards ahead, each of them had a hole on top that was pulling with blood, running down the sides and staining the moss, standing out among the green blanket like red warning flags. Which way? Vandery asked Estra, and she pointed directly across the expanse, causing Link to give up a wry smile. But as Vanderby took the first step, Link followed, with his sword already raised a thumb length from its sheath. They had a bounty to catch, and they had come too far to go back now. He gathered his SWAMP. Bob, it's nearly daytime. Hello. Azra said, prodding his arm. Jay moaned, shifted his body and closed his eyes, but the nudge on his shoulder didn't give up. M.M. Give me a second. Jay rubbed his head and sat up, gathering his thoughts. 810, X. Jay nodded at the free X, left his warm bed and sat on the chair by his desk. Azra promptly slipped under the covers, making his bed into hers, while Jay whispered at her side. Don't get too comfy. We'll be leaving today, after your final healing, so I'll wake you up soon. I will have Agatha heal you outside, then we'll leave. Here's the blanket. He said, and lay the new leather on the desk. Thanks. Azra murmured, though she was already turned away and facing the wall, her eyes shut. As Jay sat at his desk, he felt an odd sense tingling across his skin. It was like strings of web being pulled from his body and drifting towards leeches. The necrotic mana was being subtly drained from him, but it was such a small amount that it was almost imperceptible, and his mana regeneration could more than handle it. He rested a hand over leeches and delivered some mana, keeping it repairing itself. Jay was about to ask about it draining out his mana, but paused. Azra was still awake, and he didn't want her knowing leeches could talk, so he decided to have that conversation another time and left without a word. Walking outside, Jay took out his throne and left it at the side of his house. His sea was still wet from the storm, and leaving it in his inventory wasn't going to change anything. The fire was still gently flickering, carefully tended to by the skeletons overnight, and giving out a small plume of smoke, but since he planned to leave today, he let the skeletons leave it to smolder into embers. After breakfast he had little to do and a lot of mana, so he began making armor plates, which the skeletons could fix to their bodies. Archers brought back a wealth of new mushrooms, while Red stood valiantly by Jay's side, watching its masterwork. W-I-L-D-E-R-N-E-S-S -E -E -S -S. Lara and Lannister came to a sprawling expanse covered in a thick sheet of moss, and nimbly moved between boulders, hiding behind each of them. Every so often they carefully peered over, stalking their targets. They had tracked what the Orin kitten found, and covertly tailed a group of three young people, Estra, Link and Vanderby. 
They couldn't get close enough to see what level they were, but based on their youthful appearance, they were likely below level 20. As for the other two orange seeds Lannister sowed, they yielded no results. They presumed Jay continued south from Loslo, but these three adventurers moved slightly southeast. Of course, they didn't believe for a second that it was a coincidence to find them out here. The three strangers didn't analyze plants or collect samples as they went, and their clothes weren't waterproof or camouflaged, so they certainly weren't explorers and certainly too novice to be military. Lara placed one hand on the mossy boulder and glanced at Lannister. He was sitting with a ring of blue around his neck, his head vanishing into a portal. Somewhere in the sky, an almost imperceptible dot appeared, Lannister's head, watching from above as the bounty hunters moved across the mossy plain. He had to wait till they left the thick forest canopy to get a good view, but he wasn't the only one watching them. Something else had crept out of the forest, stalking them. A long body covered with hairy fur moved silently as it curved between boulders, navigating them with fluid motions. Whenever his prey glanced back it sunk closely to the ground, hiding its presence. Its body froze, then moved forward with skittish movements that revealed its clinical bug-like nature, and each movement from its numerous spiny legs showed its predatory instincts were honed to perfection. The insectoid horror's legs, segmented and covered with chitin, ended in hooks, and were the only part that weren't covered in wiry strings of fur, along with a large beak at its head, and two long spines at its tail, each twitching as it moved. Lannister pulled his head from the portal, closed the spell and slowly held his hand up to Lara, gesturing her freeze as he whispered as quietly as he could. They're about to be attacked. Lara frowned. Those three were the only clue they had, and if they had really tracked Jay this far, they could certainly lead them further to finding their necromancer. Crack. I think you should take a look at. A glare of golden light suddenly flashed from behind the boulder, causing Lara to duck as the moss around them quivered. Boom. The ground shuddered. We need to save them, Lara said, and jumped onto the boulder. Lara Lannister raised a hand to stop her. If they become a problem we'll deal with them later, she said, and nimbly dashed across the mossy rocks. Back. Get back. Vanderby yelled. Blink stood at the foot of the beast. His blade met the beak but failed to cut, sending a jolt of pain reverberating through his arms, and only leaving a dent in its hardened chitin shell. The beak, deeply embedded into ground, had missed Link's feet by inches. He had barely escaped the impact, which sent a shower of rocks and debris scattering in all directions. Its skittish body coiled forward, heaved and pulled its beak out, kicking rocks up with it. Vanderby charged, smashing his heavy shield into its underside and taunting it. But the creature didn't even budge. Link jumped back and dashed around the side of the creature, looking for a weakness while Vanderby began to yell. We. Boom. The beak powerfully dropped again, like a hammer from the heavens. Vanderbeer and its ire, his shield appearing like the top of a boulder tortoise. Bag. Vanderbeer screamed in agony. The powerful beak struck the shield on its side and shattered a chunk away before embedding into the ground again. Vanderbeer's arm twisted with the shield and snapped, a jagged bone sticking out. The weighty shield pulled on his flesh, threatening to tear the last of his arm off. This chapter was first shared on the NEO v Euros LS set 1N platform. Link began to cut at the wall of legs at its side. A few precise slashes could sever one, but each moved as a blur, and a different leg replaced another before he could lock onto a target. As for hitting it in the same spot, it was near impossible. Vanderby's eyes were widened, filled with panic. He dropped his dagger and gripped his shield, barely holding it up as his legs began to shiver. He stashed his shield away before it could pull his dangling arm off, then grabbed his dangling arm and bolted away. Vanderby's legs moved themselves as he ran back to Estra, barely keeping himself upright on the sloping rocks. The creature brought its beak out of the earth again. Its legs clicked and scraped against each other in an unsettling symphony, sounding like a nest of hissing snakes. 22 seconds. Link yelled, but his heart sank as he saw Vanderby's back, sprinting away. The beast flexed its body upwards, surveying its prey. The silky, stringy fur draping down its neck becoming motionless as it prepared another strike. Its body skittered forward over the rocks with agile speed, its beak poised to strike, about to sever Vanderby's torso from his legs. Link grit his teeth and widened his eyes, about to watch his friend die. But his friend had abandoned him. He glanced back to the forest, guessing he could make it if he sheathed his sword and used another flash step to escape. He thought it would be fair. But as the creature raised up to strike, its body shuddered. Boom. A giant boulder wrenched from the earth itself crashed into its head, knocking it down and stunning it. 
All of its legs stopped moving. Damn it. Link angrily grunted and bolted forward to seize the opportunity. He cleaved his sword into a leg until pink blood spurted on his face, but he kept hacking relentlessly, and with a crunch, he finally severed a leg but it was merely one of many. The legs twitched and began to move in their circadian rhythm. The creature's beak head slowly raised as it recovered. Link had taken the opportunity to attack, but it was pointless. Even when it was knocked out he could barely injure it, and he glanced into the forest again. Vanderby had left him to die, so he was prepared to do the same if not for the boulder that spurred him to act. Link looked around to see where it came from, but more moss and dirt kicked up as another boulder sailed through the air. Boom. It struck the creature, sending a tremor through the ground that rivaled the beak. Link stumbled away and caught a sight of a young woman in a black cloak, their mysterious savior darting effortlessly over the rocks, with another boulder hovering behind her. Chapter 363 Scout Rimmer Necrotic mana seeped from Jay's palm, the insidious gas trailing into bones, and melting them into another bone plate. L1 Lagoon witnessed the first publication of this chapter on NEOV Euros LB1N. Jay had adjusted the design slightly, adding a slight triangle point at the bottom of the rectangular shape. It was purely for aesthetic purposes, since each redesigned plate only gave one additional health, but as he looked across the twenty plates he crafted, it pleased his eyes, making it worth the effort. Crafting all twenty took up the early part of his morning. He wanted Azra healed so they could leave, but he doubted Hagatha was awake, though he couldn't blame her he certainly didn't want to be. Red, armor your guardians. He ordered, pointing to the plates he made. Red nodded and gazed into the still swamp water. A ripple surged from the depths before the two guardian skeletons sprang out with a splash, scrambled ashore and lined up at Red's side. Jay watched quietly as Red grabbed the plates and began to meld it onto their bodies. They welded one to their upper arms and lower arms, upper and lower leg, and one on each side of their ribcage. They still needed plating for the backs of their bodies, arms and legs, but Jay didn't think these stellar guardians would entertain the idea of backing down and turning to flee. Even if they could think. While the guardians weren't his hunters or monster slayers, and hadn't done much fighting, Jay chose to armor them first because, combined with Red, they were his last line of defense. As for Heavy, his heavily armored tank, he envisioned it as the first of his heavy infantry, a moving fortress of unyielding bone, and he would be crafting much thicker plates for it, and personally armor it, sealing every bone and gap under thick plates all in good time. When Red was finished Jay looked over the little guardians. Rather than being meager creations of some corrupt force, unguided and unthinking, they resembled formidable soldiers of a skeletal army. Each plate added to their striking grandeur, giving an air of strength. The clinking of bones against plating added to their unwavering presence, along with the gaze of their ethereal eyes. Jay could already envision an army of them marching in unison, creating a battle march song with each step, a death knell resounding with each step. And now, Jay held authority over them. In each hollow eye, he didn't see a trace of mindlessness or submission, but a fierce loyalty bound to his will. Good. Jay waved his hand, and Red sent them back to guarding the bridge. In their march, Jay saw an embodiment of his own determination, and a culmination of his mastery over necromancy in fact wherever he looked he was beginning to see it. The sword and shield he wielded, his bone helmet, the one-room house, and the warriors that diligently served him. Coincidentally, archers returned with another load of mushrooms, and dropped them off by the fire but Jay caught a glimpse of something. Archers, come here. He ordered, and the skeleton sprang over. As he scrutinized its bones, a curious expression crept on his face, his eyes narrowing as he observed something clinging to them, and not just the stains of black marsh water. In the places where the gray bones met the blue bones, a peculiar mold had taken root, clinging to the cracks. The mold, a delicate network of filaments, spread across the nearby bone surface in intricate patterns. Its color mirrored the abyssal black water, but as firelight gleamed over, it had a subtle red sheen. Jay guessed it hadn't affected the other skeletons since they weren't on mushroom duty, and the mold seemed to only grow at the border of the blue and grey bones, and like a silent invader, it had found a home within archers, embracing the decay of death. Jay marveled at its paradoxical beauty, it was a sign of death, spreading its tendrils out and consuming, and life, taking a defiant root in the most unexpected places. Archers and its mold were like an odd symbiosis of life, and death but it had to be snuffed out, since it was consuming his skeleton. Jay pointed to the fire, but before giving archers the order to walk through the dwindling flames, he paused and looked at archers. The skeleton wasn't responding to the mold at all, so he checked its health. I think you should take a look at. No damage. 
he thought, scratching his chin and lowering his pointing hand. Jay glanced into Archer's eyes, then at the mold, and his curiosity got the best of him. If it's not harmful, I'll see what becomes of it, he thought. Jay stored the mushrooms away, but before he could send archers off to gather more, Blue came rushing to his side and kneeled before him. Blue, what are you doing? Jay asked telepathically. Blue stood and stared awkwardly at Jay for a moment, but then it raised a skeletal arm. His bony fingers gave a rattle as all but one curled into a fist. Blue was pointing into the fog. North. Jay's eyes narrowed, your scout found something. Blue nodded its skull and raised its sword. Jay's eyes widened, he bolted over to his throne and jumped in the chair. Summon the skeletons. Get us ready to leave. Jay abruptly ordered before closing his eyes. Using the host's skill was harder for an unnamed skeleton, but Jay still sensed it clearly as it was the only one much further to the north, and with a willful push, he entered its black and white vision. A gray white wall of fog loomed imposingly over a mossy plain of rocks. Unmoving and silent, it shrouded its depths in shadows. A palpable stillness filled its heavy air, broken only by an occasional whispering breeze that stole licks of mist, teasing glimpses of whatever lurked inside. Even the simplest and most brutish creatures didn't dare venture in, their instinct stopping them from setting foot closer to the shadowy featureless fog, which toyed with perception, and made clarity dissolve into a hazy unknown. Yet, despite the hesitation of others, a figure emerged from the heart of the fog. From a shifting mist, it's materialized a solitary presence defying the unknown. It moved with purpose, its glowing green gaze fixed on its duty. Tendrils of fog latched to its bones as it stepped out of the white wall, and it gazed across the mossy plain. And after scanning for threats its skeletal body dashed forward, hiding by a mossy rock before continuing its journey. Sent there as a scout, Blue's subskeleton moved with an instinctive fluid-like grace, as it darted between rocks and kept its presence to a minimum, navigating through the lowest points of the mossy carpet. It was ready to bolt to the next jagged rock, but froze. A tremor ran through the ground. Its skull creaked around, clicking as it swiveled, its shade vision offering up the contents of the shadows around it. Another tremor spread through the ground, causing it to crouch low. But, knowing its mission, it crawled atop the rock it hid behind to get a better look, and scan the horizon. Another tremor resounded as a low groan in the earth, and in the distance a plume of dirt shot up. The figures that caused it were far away, appearing like tiny dots but they were close enough to identify, and their forms were unmistakable. Humans. It held its body closely to the rock, hiding its presence as it monitored them, and Blue was instantly aware of its finding. Chapter 364. Untamed. The scouting skeleton fixed its eyes to five humans engaged in battle. Jay observed from its haunting gaze as giant boulders crashed down onto a large writhing creature. He was too far away to hear the sounds of screams or screeches, but the attacks were powerful enough to send deep hurling quakes through the entire rocky plain, and he was certain the grand attacks could end him and his skeletons in one strike. As he watched he saw the flutters of cloaks. None of the humans had the hulking angular suits of black stone armor that he'd seen elite soldiers wearing, so he wondered exactly who these people were. Adventurers. Explorers. Hunters. All were possibilities, but being this far from Lasla was too much of a coincidence. He guessed they were hunting him likely a nimble scouting force of the military. The creature fought to raise its battered form, but each time the weight of another colossal boulder bore down, pressing it back into the jagged rocks below. A final boulder, massive and unyielding, descended with a thunderous crash that silenced its resistance, and its struggle ceased under the overwhelming force. Lara's fixed her gaze on the creature's twitching body, as a sickening crunch reverberated through the air. His segmented legs shuddered, sounding like a rushing whine through treetops as the chinless armor gnashed against itself. The head of its body was under a boulder, and a splatter of fluids began to pull underneath. But another boulder was ready, quietly floating above Lara as a new threat arose not a bug, but a human. They were strangers, worthy of an ounce of distrust, but Lara's suspicion deepened as she watched Link raise his sword in her direction after the battle. The wilderness was a lawless realm, and the action of this stranger sent alarm bells ringing in her mind. Link's eyes filled with determination, his sword poised to strike, pointed at Lara. Their eyes locked, and a silent exchange of resolve passed between them. The slightest twitch of muscle was all it would take for either to attack, and each only needed one flick of the wrist to end the other. A silent tension hung in the air, charging the atmosphere with anticipation, as the battlefield held its breath. Time seemed to slow as they sized one another up and locked onto each other's movements. But the heavy silence was broken. 
Thank you for saving us. A girl called Esther stood by Vanderby's side, holding his bloody broken arm straight so it could heal. But Lara kept her eyes narrowed on Link, ignoring the girl and waiting for whatever would happen. This chapter was first shared on the NEOV Euros LS set 1N platform. Palpable killing intent still surged, feeling like a sharpened knife tracing over their nerves, but after a moment, Link's determined expression softened, and he slowly lowered his sword. Lara kept the boulder hovering in the air until Link sheathed his weapon, unwilling to take any chances. Vanderby was still in pain, but sensing the danger he spoke up. Are you after the bounty too? Vanderby asked, and at that moment Lannister arrived, running over rocks. Yes. Lannister said, catching up to Lara and moving to her side. Compared to her, his demeanor much more casual and leaned on a boulder. You're welcome by the way. He added, pointing at the giant crushed bug which had stopped witching. Link relaxed his posture and removed his grip from his sword, and Lara reluctantly released the boulder from her control, the intense gaze between her and Link unbroken. Despite the apparent ceasefire, she remained on high alert, her instincts urging her to be cautious. The insectoid body shuddered once more, the nerves pinched from the pressure. Esther helped Vanderby over, but analyzed them as she went. Lannister, Lara, nice to meet you. Esther smiled, still trying to diffuse the tension. Lannister and Lara both nodded in response, and Vanderby spoke up. Did you two want to team up with us? We'll be happy to split the bounty. He abruptly offered. Link still stood some distance away, but raised a brow as his mind raced with conflicting thoughts. Should he trust these strangers? Or was it safer to maintain his guard and prepare for the worst? Vanderby offered to team up with them without so much as a discussion, and Link grit his teeth slightly, still annoyed at his tank abandoning him during the battle. However, he remained silent that creature taught them one thing, which was that they were far out of their depth. Any help would be welcomed with open arms. Lannister glanced at Lara, trying to read her eyes. She blinked and slightly tilted her head. Sure. 50-50 he split. Lannister said, but Vanderby replied in a cunning and smooth tone. Ah, but there's three of us and two of you. How about 60-40? That way we all get a fair amount. Lannister shrugged, that sounds fair. He nodded. Link walked closer to the group, but slowed his steps after hearing Lannister's last comment. He agreed without argument. No pushback. No counteroffer. They could take a 90% cut and we would accept it, we would have no choice. Link thought, and hid his suspicions under a facade of tiredness. Vanderby grinned, thinking he had used his sly charm to win them over. Excellent. So, I can tell you're the brawn. Vanderby pointed at Lara, then turned to Lannister, so you must be the tracker. Yep. Lannister nodded, and Lara's lips slightly curled, a subtle sign of the laughter she was feeling from Lannister's lies. How about you three? Lannister asked. Well, she's the tracker, Link is the damage dealer, and I'm the tank. Vanderby said, then murmured to Link, sorry about that by the way. He scratched his head, pursing his lips. Link shrugged, it's fine. He said casually, but inwardly was furious about it. Link could have died and all he got was a half-ass apology. It was despicable. However, other pressing thoughts plagued his mind these two strangers didn't seem to care about the bounty. They didn't push back or argue in any way about their cut, there was no haggling, no threats. They also had a tracker Lannister so why would they need them? Would these stranger kill them once this was over and take the bounty for themselves, using him and his so-called friends as the sacrificial pawns? But Link kept his suspicion to himself, and kept his guard up, and his senses heightened. With his flash step ready, he never once let Lara out of his sight. As for the others, Link no longer felt any hesitation at the thought of abandoning them in the blink of an eye. After all, this was all about gold. They had placed their lives on the line for it, so the lives of his acquaintances was an easy thing to sacrifice. Especially after Vanderby had abandoned him. Are you ready to move? We want to get out of the wilderness as soon as possible, Lannister said. Vanderby flexed his healed arm, yep. He said, and glanced at Link, who nodded back as he stood near the side of the group, but was a few steps further away than the others. Estra. Direction. Lannister asked. Estra smiled, and pointed across the mossy plain. As I thought. Let's go. Lannister said, and they began to march. As they traversed the mossy plain, the two groups remained divided, walking in close proximity to their own members, and maintaining a noticeable distance from the strangers. The distance of a stone's throw separated them. 
the two groups maintained a distance, as if an invisible barrier separated them, mirroring the lingering doubt and unease that lingered in the air. However, it seemed that Link was the only one to feel it. Link and Lara remained at the back of each party, but instead of scanning for threats across the rocky pane, their distrustful sights were turned inwards, occasionally glancing at one another, and creating a subtle tension. She's some kind of earth mage. As long as she doesn't have a defensive wall ability I think I could reach her. Or I could just flash step into invisibility and leave. Link thought, watching Vanderby and Estra ahead of him as he plotted for what he believed what inevitable. Taking some precautionary measures, Link sped up to Vanderby, and Esther walked closer to their side. Hey. Don't tell them about my ability. Link whispered. What why not? Vanderby said, raising a brow. Link knew what Vanderby was like, so he lied. I want to save it, to impress them. It will make us all look good. Link whispered, and gave a quick glance at Lara, who had her eyes narrowed on him. Vanderby smiled with a chuckle. Well sure. Just make sure they lower their heads before you use it. I don't want any sudden deaths to be on our hands. He whispered back. Esther kept her mouth shut, but gave a cheeky smile and a nod at Link's plan, hoping those powerful adventurers would spread tales of their bounty hunting. With his ability's weakness hidden, Link returned to the back of the party, but noticed Lara similarly began to whisper with Lannister, who kept an unassuming gentle smile on his face, and a casual stride that made Link's skin crawl. The trio had survived in the cities, using blackmail, seekers or errands to survive. There was always law and order that they would slip under to achieve their goals, but its presence was what kept them safe. However the wilderness came with its own rules, and to Link, one thing was clear. They weren't just out of their depth when it came to monsters, but also in dealing with strangers in this untamed land. Chapter 365 Seal Jay ended the host's skill, grit his teeth and sprung from his chair, before giving out a plethora of orders. Lou, get Higatha. We're about to leave. Extinguish the fire. Recall everyone, and all the subskeletons. Cover up the dirt moles. Wipe every trace we were here and gather every bone. While Jay used the host's skill, Lou had already recalled his four subskeletons. Together they entered Higatha's shack. The other skeletons all abruptly moved, throwing firewood into the swamp water, smothering the embers, and throwing them in too, and filling in the mold holes. Jay entered his house and stuffed leeches into his bag. He added his bedding into his inventory, leaving Azra lying on the bone bed frame. Azra sensed his panic before she had awakened, and found herself being jostled and carried in his arms with a new leather blanket on top. As Jay stepped off the ramp, the single-room house she slept in disappeared into a wave of necrotic gas leave the bone bridge. Jay ordered, seeing that they were ripping bones out of it, and either eating them or tossing them into the depths. Jay sensed that Red's guardian skeletons had went to the other shore, and were likely sweeping away any signs of them being there. Brah. Higatha called, being pulled out of the shack, what is this? We had deal. You promise not to hurt me if I don't hurt you. We still have a deal. He lies right now or the deal's off. Jay ordered, and a surge of killing intent came from him and the skeletons currently clasping each of her limbs. Higatha's eyes widened. The roof of her shack, covered in sentient leaves, shuddered in response and pointed up like hairs across cold skin, but none of them left their place. Ah yes. I will. Just let me get ready. Higatha grunted, and shook the skeletons clutching her body. Jay nodded, and they released her. Bob. What's going on? Azra said, and pushed herself out of his arms and stood up. We need to leave. Here. Jay said, checking the blood compass one last time before handing it to her. You'll guide us while I attend to other matters. Jay said, knowing he would be using the host's skill to monitor everything from his throne when they began to march. Azra was still waking up, and furrowed her brows as she softly took the blood compass, while Jay glanced at Red, who nodded in response, accepting that Azra would be their navigator. Jay rushed across the bone bridge. It had surfaced after the storm, and now the swamp's water levels were returning to normal. Reaching the end of the bridge, he held out his gauntlet and carefully channeled them into his gauntlet while backing up towards the island. In moments the bridge disappeared, and he went to the other side of the island. Bones spewed forward from the gauntlet, splashing down and making a haphazard bridge in the direction the compass had pointed until he reached the other shore. It was about four times as long as the first bridge, and took some time, but he sped up the construction by neglecting to make a flat top layer with smaller bones. 
Jay scanned the other side of the shore for enemies, but as it was shrouded in heavy fog, and he guessed the firelights were also active here, attacking whatever moved with unhealing, scorching fire. But as he turned, something caught his eye gleaming amidst the darkness. The white feather, unstained and untouched by any grime, was poking up from the soil like a flag, begging him to pluck it. Jay froze, and checked around once more, looking into the sky too, but it was perfectly silent. This was the third feather he had found, and he wondered how whoever placed it here knew where he was going. He felt like he was playing into the hands of the higher intelligence, walking into an unavoidable trap, but nevertheless he grabbed it, and analyzed it before stashing it away. Virtual Companion Feather Waking Wrath Hidden Through Sacrifice Created by Hidden Through Sacrifice Jay wasn't sure what the Waking Wrath skill would do, but he wasn't inclined to try it in the slightest. Besides, if it were useful, he only had three of these strange sparkling feathers, and he had other priorities to deal with. With the bridge constructed the bone reserve and his gauntlet dropped by a few percent, but it was still negligible. As he ran back across the newly formed bridge, he saw Hagatha standing outside of her shack, holding a clay jar over Anya's body, her hand on the lid, about to open it. Jay's eyes widened in disbelief, his fury raging. Stop her. Don't let the jar open. His willful telepathic command swept through the skeletons like a wave, and all of them dropped their tasks, rushing towards Hagatha with swords raised. Hagatha froze as blades rested against her neck, and claws latched onto her skin, threatening to tear it all asunder. Lou had dropped his sword, his hands placed around the jar, and holding it shut before Hagatha could try anything. The initial instance of this chapter being available happened at N0V3L bin. Jay arrived, his eyes narrowing as he fixed a piercing gaze on Hagatha. He didn't want her knowing that he knew about the jar and what was in it, but that much was probably obvious by now. You will heal her without the jar. He said lowly, a sense of threat in his voice. I needed to heal. Higatha replied, and shifted her eyes around to look at Jay. She wasn't willing to turn her head, not with the ring of swords surrounding her neck. You never needed it before. Azra said, squinting as she lay on the noon leather blanket. Jay pulled out a breaking shard. Higatha's eyes locked onto the shard, her gaze filled with a sick desire as he held it in the air. Do it the normal way. Jay said, pulled his arm back and lobbed it into the swamp water. Higatha's heart sank and her neck gently pressed against the swords at her throat. But Jay pulled out and held another in his palm, or you'll never see another one again. Higatha frowned, fine. She gave one last glance at the ripple from the breaking shard he tossed into the water, trying to remember its location. As for Jay, he had no more time to spare, no more patience, and he wouldn't hesitate to force her into submission through pain if necessary, and trying to wound Azra with one of those unhealing flames was the final insult that he scarcely tolerated. Lou removed the jar from her trembling hands and kept it sealed, and Jay made up in his mind to seal Higatha's fate. Jay let Higatha move again, but kept Sweeper, Lou and the sub-skeletons close to Higatha, as she grit her teeth, and resentfully started the final healing process. Their keen eyes watched her every movement as she crushed leaves and ate them. Azra's wound turned from reddish inflamed skin into the pale white you like the rest of it, and Azra nodded as the pain finally subsided. Good. Now, return to your basement. The skeletons will bring you the shards after we leave, Jay said. He had Sweeper and the sub-skeletons escort her, nudging her into her shack and making sure she didn't try anything, while the other skeletons brought the throne over. Higatha presumed to be safe, however, Jay wasn't finished with her. She had broken the deal when she tried to burn Azra, so he was free to enact whatever retribution he could dream up, whether it be to drown her or have her cut down in a quick death. But like the firelight she had stashed in clay jars to slowly burn out and extinguish, Jay decided that a slow death would be a more fitting punishment. Chapter 366 Hopeless Mirror Reality 34 Heather raised a brow at Smiley's request. So, you want me to separate this into two parts and push them into the dungeon? Smiley grinned, yes. Blue first, then the red. Heather pursed her lips as she looked into the warp charge. She was a little unsure of Smiley, as everyone knew about the smiling demon, and she hadn't actually seen a warp charge either even so, there was no telling what the blue and red energy swirling inside would do. But she traced a sentimental finger across her hair clip, a silent acknowledgement of the debt she owed Loki standing by their side. Heather began using her power while Smiley looked on from the side, though he hid his cunning grin, stifling it from appearing on his face, as the blue energy miraculously responded. 
instead of a raging storm of red lightning and blue waves that mingled together, they separated to either end of the warp charge and, without even breaking the charge open, Heather extracted it, somehow pulling it through the lichen metal and green glass alike. See, I told you she could help. Loki said with a proud smile, but it immediately disappeared after a threatening gaze from Smiley. As Heather directed her hand toward the dungeon portal, her muscles tensed with strain. The portal responded, eliciting widened eyes from Smiley. The blue energy swirled around a small point of nothingness. It abruptly collapsed onto it and tore a hole open in the delicate fabric of the mirror reality. Drawn closer, Smiley prepared to leap through the portal into the real world. However, as his gaze met the other side, his heart sank. A dishearteningly familiar bamboo forest stretched before him. Smiley grit his teeth but held his temper in. When it closes, try the red energy next. He said coldly, and his eyes narrowed onto Loki for a moment. He gathered his SWAMP. Jay ascended his throne with Azra at his feet who was sitting on the noon leather blanket. She would have demanded the chair, but Jay seemed far too tense to fuss around with small things like that. However, the skeletons didn't lift up the throne to begin their march. So, what now? Azra asked with a yawn. I just have one more little thing to do. Give me a second. Jay said, closed his eyes and used the host skill. Azra raised a brow, seeing his body go limp and his mouth fall open, unsure if she should try to close it. Jay entered the eyes of Sweeper. The skeletons had taken Higatha into the abominable basement where she chanted her sickening sweet curses to her black altar, where she lured children, as well as created the dangerous firelights that plagued the fog, and the sentient leaves which she occasionally ate. Unknowingly, Jay he had become an unwilling pawn in Higatha's plans, but the connection between the breaking shards, the black altar, or how they mixed and melted into the life-giving vapor she inhaled from it, remained a mystery, so the extent of his mistakes weren't completely apparent. Lou, leave your subskeletons in the basement with Sweeper and return to my side with all the others. Jay ordered. The four subskeletons moved into a formation around Sweeper, who stood with its back to the mirror. And then, Jay took direct control. In the bone body he turned around, gripping its sword tightly with his bony fingers. This short-range mirror teleport was the only way out of here. The third symbol. He thought, remembering what leeches had told him, and with resolve, he placed the tip of the sword against the wall and pushed on the back. The sword groaned as it scraped across the stone, cutting through the symbol with a grind. Hey! Stop! Higatha yelled. Amidst the sound of her desperate struggle against the subskeletons, Jay refused to divert his gaze to her panic face. With resolute determination he pressed his sword onto the next symbol and swiftly destroyed it. The portal weakened, its mirror-like reflection turned into an opaque haze. Higatha yelled and groaned, likely cut by a few swords, but never gave up her desperate screaming. We had a deal. A deal. You promised. She yelled, her voice sounded pained. Jay couldn't reply well in the body of a skeleton, but he doubted he would have anything to say, even if he weren't. He placed the sword against the last symbol, and paused for a moment. It was a hard thing to place someone's life in your hands, and then seal their fate. You don't know what you're doing. Stop. Please. Higatha gave a final desperate plea. This chapter was first shared on the NEOV Euros LS set 1N platform. Shring. A scraping of dust kicked into the air as his sword cut through the last symbol. The mirror portal, without any form of resonance, glimmered for a moment and safely shut down, turning back into the cold stone wall. No. No Higatha called, but her voice turned weak, and all the fight she had left in her evaporated like a dying flame. Her anguished voice sent a cold chill trailing up Jay's spine, a sensation that pierced even through his skeletal form. Compelled by a mix of curiosity and compassion, he finally turned around to witness her pitiful state. Tears streamed down her weathered cheeks, carving a path through the layers of dirt, as it etched sorrow onto her face. Her eyes, once fiercely defiant and as unrelenting as the consuming swamp, were now empty, vacant, like they were coated with a layer of wax that dulled her untamable spirit. The weight of her hopelessness was a suffocating silence. She was unable to push past the subskeletons, leaving her body marked with seeping cuts, but now, there was no fight left in her. Her hands dropped to her sides and she fell to her knees. Jay remained as a silent observer, it was too late to question her. He could have ended the host's skill, but out of curiosity, and perhaps compassion, he kept listening, watching. Everything. I gave up everything. She whispered, her voice barely audible, but each word heavier than the last. 
Knowing the harsh swamp life she chose for herself, he could almost grasp the countless burdens, sacrifices and struggles she faced. Jay wondered if he would say the same thing. At least I can give up now. At least she closed her eyes. Jay was about to end the host's skill, but at that moment a strange buzzing sound filled the room. His eyes scanned the room for the sound, and in a darkened corner a glow began to emerge. Jay glanced back at the mirror, still just a mundane wall covered with faded runes. He gathered remained so lost in her hopeless thoughts of despair that she no longer responded to anything, completely oblivious to the strange light. It clearly wasn't her doing, neither the broken mirror. As for the clay jars that held more of the dangerous firelights, he hadn't heard any of them shatter, so it couldn't be one of those creatures either. The light pulsed and swirled, casting flickering shadows around the room. Jay's instincts kicked in, sensing the imminent danger. His grip tightened around the bone sword, his senses sharpening as the buzzing grew louder. In a burst of brilliant light, the energy transformed into a swirling portal, banishing every lingering shadow. Crackling energy coursed around its outside, and Jay only had a single thought. Shit. Chapter 367. Another Pawn. This doesn't feel right. I don't know if I can control it. Heather murmured, but Smiley wasn't going to let her give up. Just move the warp charge closer before extracting it. Smiley said, and Heather did so. It would help a little, but just keeping it from exploding was a challenge. It was clear that the blue energy kept it subdued in some way. You can do this. Smiley said, encouraging her as he stood at her side and patted her shoulder. Loki watched from afar, but his mouth fell agape. He was more shocked at this comment than the portal experiments. If he told anyone at the academy that the smiling demon encouraged someone, he would be laughed out of any class in an uproar. The warp charge responded to Heather's power as her mind went under strain, her brows furrowing and teeth clenching, as she wrestled with the unstable red energy, but she slowly seeped it through the glass containment chamber. The red energy crackled and sparked, fighting furiously to escape whatever containment or power tried to contain it. By its own nature, it wished to burst into a chaotic blaze, ending its wrathful existence in a self-destructive glorious blast. The dungeon entrance began to respond, and the rubble remains from the last warp charge experiment flickered back into existence, showing the crater damage that Smiley's first warp charge had created, after he dashed it with his sword. Smiley immediately sensed danger. His eyes narrowed and he instinctively lowered into a combat stance, readying his sword. Do it. He whispered to Heather's ear, and as the energy pulled on the entrance, she finally released her grasp. Finally set free, the red power did everything it could to ignite, unleashing its raw fury. A clap of thunder rolled over them with a pulse of energy, a red wave spreading through the entire mirror reality, rippling and tearing the fabric of the pocket dimension. The void rifts opened, tearing wider. Gravity intensified and loosened. Pockets of air superheated, distorting vision into swirling waves. Parts of the forest instantly blazed with fire, tree trunks splitting and cracking from the sudden heat. Other parts turned too into fractals, splitting into infinite copies and mirrors of themselves. Pockets of time hastened and slowed, everything caught between was rend into halves. The ground quaked with deep groans, unable to contend with the empty voids swallowing everything they touched. Despite the hellscape they created, Smiley's eyes were fixed to a gleaming red ring, hissing and spitting caustic energy as it swirled around a portal. The rings around portals were supposed to be blue, but this red ring was otherworldly, causing fear to strike his heart, a threat to his very mind and soul. He had never seen anything like it but it was a portal nonetheless, and the other side was much darker than the bamboo forest dungeon. Some were entirely different. He had succeeded, but it too dark to tell exactly what or where he would be walking into. The crumbling mirror reality was dangerous, but jumping into an unknown abyss was not an option. You did it. Smiley whispered, and glanced at the girl. At his side, Heather was shaking, hugging her arms from the danger she unleashed. Smiley would have told her off for being scared, but time was fleeting, and he had to act. Smiley grabbed Heather's wrist, pulling her closer to the portal. Take a look at what you've accomplished. Be proud. He said, fighting all his senses to stop himself from running from the crackling red energy surrounding the portal. I I, I didn't. This wasn't Heather could barely speak, but as she drew near, her eyes widened. The energy reached out to her, and her eyes flickered white. All her fear was replaced with a dazed look. Something was drawing her, a curiosity that transcended logic, an allure she couldn't resist. Captivated by the darkness, she ignored all signs of danger and looked into it, pulling her eyes into focus, and trying to make out any details she could. Be proud. 
Smiley said, and raised his boot. Thud. A heavy blow landed on Heather's back. Smiley had planted his boot and Spartan kicked her into the portal. Heather didn't scream as she went in, even as the red energy seared her skin as she passed by. Her mind was entirely consumed by something she wanted, needed to grasp. But she wasn't the only one scathed by chaotic energy. GRRH. Smiley grit his teeth as a tendril of the red power lashed out, crackling around his boot and melting the flesh within. But as Heather plunged into the abyss, he immediately refocused himself, ignoring the pain and looking into the authorworldly portal. Heather breached the darkness, shattering and tearing it like a veil. There was a dark membrane across it, but it no longer blocked sight to the other side. Heather lay on the ground, writhing in pain on a cold stone floor. Smiley was ready to jump in, but froze as noticed something else, peering up. Haunting eyes peered from the shadows, a luminous green glow, filling the eye sockets of empty skulls. A black altar. A room filled with clay jars, and a large, unmoving figure with a hulking body kneeling before the undead. Both Smiley and the skeletons were as confused as each other, each stopping in their tracks. And with a shudder the portal snapped close in a blinding flash. You kicked her. You fucking kicked her. WH what was that through the portal? Loki said, his voice trembling. Hell. Smiley coldly said. He stepped back from the disappearing portal as his only exit closed. Whether his indecision to jump through had killed or saved him, he couldn't be sure, but without Heather, there was no way to repeat the experiment, even though he had another warp charge. The forest around them was burning. The academy's headmaster's voice began to sound out through the forest, calling everyone back to the academy. Smiley frowned. He had failed but felt like he was one step closer to his escape, but he guessed they would evacuate everyone, and he would have a better chance at escape in the real world. Or, they would just kill him. With the temple robe equipped, Smiley began to sprint back through the forest, passing by the markers he had laid, and escaping the reality-warping effects of a broken dimension. Hey, wait. Loki called, sheepishly following along. But he couldn't keep up with Smiley's speed. However, that was the least of Loki's problems. His fingers started disappearing, turning invisible. The others were enacting their revenge, the academy had become unstable, allowing them free reign to cast their forbidden spells, and Loki had angered them. Loki passed by bushes and branches as he ran, but as he went to push them away his hands and body went right through them. Loki knew he wasn't being erased from existence, instead he was becoming completely imperceivable, though he wasn't sure which was fate was worse. He had angered the others, and this was his punishment, a full taste of their powers with only one remedy to grovel, and beg at their feet. Plunge into the depths of NOV Euros LSZN, where information dwells. Smiley kept running, ignoring the calls of Loki until they turned to a distant murmur, becoming nothing but whispering echoes. And a few moments later he wondered what Loki looked like, who Loki was, until the name slipped from his mind as if it never existed. The crystal projected voice summoning all students back to the academy became distorted, sounding slow and deep in some parts of the forest, or fast and high-pitched in others. Numerous voids began springing up through the mere reality, pushed up by some unknown force, as the trees rejected the ground. One sprung up before Smiley, blocking his path, the other side of the tree fell into black nothingness and pulled in the earth, leaving only a deep pit behind. The colorful patterns on the temple robe were shifting and buzzing frantically, as if they were trying to leap from the fabric and run for cover. The robe's patterns were an early warning sign of reality instability, but no matter which way Smiley turned, the patterns never stopped moving. He grit his teeth and pressed on, following the safety markers he'd laid to the best of his ability, as swiftly as his feet could carry him. He saw some students along the way, but without a second glance he brushed past them, uncaring for their looks of shock and horror, as the world crumbled, and uncaring if they followed him or not. Chapter 368. Wretched. He got his B.A.S.E.M.E.N.T. All four subskeletons went on high alert as a crackling portal formed in a darkened corner of the basement. Jay's eyes would have widened if he wasn't in the body of Sweeper, instead, his hollow eyes glowed a little more brightly. But the portal appearing without warning, wasn't the most shocking thing for through the portal he saw a familiar face, one that made him scowl as it looked down on them with little regard. Blonder hair, blue eyes, and an upturned nose with a disdainful glare. Matheson. Bastard. He's helping them to find me. But how? Jay thought, and the sweeper's jaw clenched in anger. It was as alarming as it was puzzling, but none of it mattered if they found him. Jay had to move. However, Higatha rose to her feet. Her body glowed with a coating of energy, distorting the air around her. 
The other girl in the room, Heather, began to scream in agony. Her body convulsed and boiled, morphing and remolding itself with large bumps, as the skin turned to boils and warts. Jay wondered if he should save Heather, but it was already too late. The mirror portal was sealed. She would likely become food for Higatha, if the girl survived whatever energies were warping her flesh. But before Jay could do anything Heather and Higatha's body slid across the room, drawn to each other like strong magnets. As their hands touched, Higatha screamed in joy. I I remember. Higatha's eyes shot open, broken from her hopeless stupor, even as Heather wailed in agony. Each eye filled with swirling red energy, resonating with the portal. Heather's face crunched deeper in pain, while Higatha's grinned with tearful joy. Their skin melted together like hot butter, pulled into one another, and mixing in a disgusting mess. Jay didn't know what he was witnessing. He could feel their bones, snapping and mixing together faster than his necrotic mana could hope to achieve. Heather's face crunched in horrifying suffering, twisting into a pain that Jay never wanted to witness. He was tempted to end Heather's suffering out of mercy with a slit to the throat, but it was too late to save her. Their bodies was already connected and merging. Higatha was doing much better, grinning widely in unfathomable ecstasy, moaning in a sickening pleasure. Their heads touched and so did their minds. But Higatha never stopped yelling. I remember everything. I am Heg. Heatha. Heather. I am Heather. She screamed as he mouth and eyelids tripped with blood. Heather. Jay thought, but before he could remember the name the red portal snapped shut, crashing on itself with a powerful pulse of red energy. This chapter was first shared on the NEOV Euros LS set 1N platform. Heather and Higatha's merged bodies disappeared with it. Wherever they were sent, he couldn't be sure but it didn't matter. The wave of energy traveled over Sweeper, and as it touched the skeletal frame Jay felt a searing pain, as if the skeleton's body was his own. In that moment he thought he had gained its senses, but he was sure they couldn't sense pain, so this was something else. The pulse pushed into his chest, a hammer to his guts. It separated soul from body, and since his grip on the skeleton was only by the mere host's skill, it completely detached him from his minion. His mind span, writhing with pain as he left its skeletal body. But he didn't return to his own. The immaterial force sent his mind spiraling into abyssal darkness. Jay was alone again. Mirror Reality 34. The Academy Castle shuddered. It was not as secure as they thought. Deep cracks trailed through the walls, and pebbles flickered out after dying runes, giving up the last of their energy. Nothing could withstand the assault on reality itself. Darkness cannot comprehend light, and so the immaterial cannot comprehend material, swallowing everything up with little resistance. As Smiley ran, a glow of red energy trailed from his boot, searing his foot, and making each step cut an unstable path into the realm, only serving to break it apart further. But that was what he wanted. If he couldn't be free, then no one could. If he died here, then at the very least they would know what it's like to be caged in, controlled and hopeless, powerless to escape. However, as Smiley entered the academy's courtyard, he didn't see the signs of misery he was anticipating. Some even looked hopeful, which sickened him. A number of students surrounded the teachers, with Norgrim at the center. Find them and bring them here, Norgrim said, and a few students dashed away into the academy corridors. But as he saw Smiley, his eyes narrowed, and he whispered to Evelyn. After receiving instructions from Norgrim, Evelyn marched over and blurted out an order. Go to the teleport staging area and bring back a warp charge. There are others who went so there will be a marked path. She said. Why would you need a warp charge? Shouldn't we all be heading there to escape? Smiley asked, but Evelyn's gaze turned cold, unwilling to explain. You have your orders. Hurry up and go. She said, but it was obvious she was hiding something. Sure. Okay. Smiley shrugged, raising his eyebrows as if he didn't care about the outcome. Evelyn's face turned bitter, but he turned away before it could change into a full-blown scowl. Smiley jogged back out of the stone gate of the academy and moved around the wall, out of sight. He saw the markers left by others who had the temporal robes, but he stopped by the wall. They're not desperate enough. Not yet. But it's only a matter of time. Smiley thought with a devilish grin. As he waited by the crumbling wall its runes glowed brighter, trying to resist whatever forces were at work against it. He also saw other people in the forest none of which were moving, frozen in time with desperate looks on their faces, their robes caught in an eternal flutter of stillness, while others weren't so lucky. Some were left the ashes of torsos and floating body parts, some had merged into rocks and trees, as pockets of reality lost all logic, rhyme or reason. 
even with their powerful varying classes, most of them were no match for the world they found themselves in. Chapter 369 Smiley's Gambit Smiley grit his teeth as the chaotic red energy cut into his foot, but he continued to suppress any sign of it. He'd grown used to pain, and even mocked it, thinking it paled in comparison to the workouts he'd put himself through on a daily basis. Though nothing could compare to the parasite when it dug into his neck, which was placed there by Sylvia, the so-called parasite queen. It was his own little indial kill switch, keeping his life in their hands. As if being trapped here wasn't enough. Smiley leaned against the wall while watching the world crumble. Blazing fires swept through the forest, only stopped by rifts of void, pockets of frozen time and other areas where the temperature reached absolute zero. Other teachers ran out wearing temporal robes, finding a trail of markers leading to the teleport area, but none of them turned back to see Smiley by the wall. His presence was masked by the sense of danger spreading through the realm. Those fools. Smiley thought. He knew how far it was to the teleport staging area, about a five-minute sprint, but after fifteen minutes no one had returned yet. But seeing more leave was a good sign, the faculty were getting nervous. As for seeking a warp charge, he guessed they must have a teleport gateway somewhere in the academy, so it was obvious why they didn't make an ill-fated attempt at rushing to the staging area, and as he watched one of the safety markers get swallowed in a sea of flames, he wasn't worried in the slightest. It just meant that others wouldn't return from the teleport staging area, and with no concerns about them returning and saying he never even went there, he stepped away from the, the wall, did some push-ups to make himself seem exhausted, and entered the academy again. As he walked towards the courtyard he noticed a trail of safety markers leading along the side of the path he had traveled, but the patterns on his temporal robes were still waving frantically, no matter where he stepped. In the courtyard, no more students were present. They had all abandoned it, leaving only a trail of markers into the administration building. Maybe I waited too long, Smiley thought. He dashed across the courtyard, following the trail into the building and up the stairs to higher floors. Finally he heard signs of life, hushed whispers in the hallway outside the headmaster's office Norgram's abode. As Smiley turned the corner, eyes lit up with hope. He did it. The demon did it. A student called. All heads turned his way, but he only met their gazes with a cold glare. They did nothing to save him, and now he was supposed to save them. It was sickening. An intrusive thought flashed through Smiley's mind, an idea to pull out the warp charge, and cut it to pieces before their eyes. But he didn't hate them enough to him to seal his own fate with them. As he walked by their cheerful faces, he remembered a thankful smile he once received when slaying Trins at Laslo. Genuine smiles of gratitude were so alien that it made him suspicious. He thought that no one was truly thankful, a smile was just the tool of the cunning to latch onto him. Though he couldn't help but feel a twinge of guilt, as he had caused all of this. Nevertheless, his face remained cold, his glare disdainful. This chapter made its debut appearance via N0V3LB1N. Evelyn stood outside the door of Norgram's office, and her once bitter face had turned to a gentle smile as she saw a sign, a hope approaching. You did it. She asked. I have a warp charge. Evelyn held out her hand, expecting him to hand it over. But Smiley fought against his instinct to submit to her higher level, grit his teeth, and pushed out words that were almost too hard to say. How much is it worth to you? Evelyn's mouth dropped. Her brows furrowed in anger. All the students went quiet and stared as they felt a thick tension fill the air. You dare. Bargain for it, she yelled. Evelyn wouldn't entertain such an idea. She raised her hands up at her sides, and shadows emerged from her feet, spreading across the floor. Smiley felt her killing intent and jumped away, raising his sword and preparing to fight. The shadows of flowers, plants and trees appeared, each swaying in an imperceivable wind. Smiley positioned himself behind other students, and the shadows spread over them, coating their bodies in shadowy leaves, but harmlessly so. Shadow forest. Smiley thought, wondering what her ability could do. But a figure emerged in the shadow forest, a human one, lashing out desperately and trying to claw at his feet. He sensed that if those shadows touched his body, he would share the same fate as that pool soul. Smiley dashed further back, not letting it touch his body and planning his attack. Stop. Norgram yelled from behind the door. He had sensed everything and slammed the door open. The ambient mana surge then disappeared, leaving no traces behind, and no unusual shadows. Norgram applied his full mana control, and anyone trying to mana craft failed, unable to keep their mana fixed and attuned as it slipped from their fingers before signs of it could materialize. Evelyn frowned, and tried to explain herself. He wants to bargain for the warp charge. Is this true? 
Nordgrim said with a disheartened frown while looking at Smiley. Smiley's eyes narrowed. Freedom for freedom. I want this bug out of my neck, then I leave unharmed through the portal. Is that so much to ask? Norgrim pursed his lips and his eyes trailed across the students, not wanting to let them stay here any longer, or to kill someone in front of them, it would certainly lower morale. There was also the chance of harming the warp charge. But for just a single moment his eyes landed on Smiley's boot, causing him to raise a brown whisper to Evelyn. Evelyn couldn't help but glancing at the boot too, but she kept her mouth shut. We wholeheartedly accept. Step into my office. Eve, bring Sylvia. Norgrim said to both of them. Evelyn nodded and went to Sylvia's laboratory. Sylvia was still packing up her research, and in the middle of her room, a monster's body twitched on a stone slab as tiny bugs crawled across it. At first, Sylvia didn't accept the request to come with Evelyn, and kept stashing things away, but after Evelyn explained further, she grit her teeth and left her precious experiments behind. Smiley scanned the room for threats as he entered, but Norgrim had dispersed the ambient mana completely, making it safe from any magical traps. As Smiley stepped into Norgrim's office, it was different. Norgrim's table was pushed against a wall, his carpet rolled up to the side, and in the middle of the room was a circle filled with runic engravings, cut into the stone floor. It seemed that it had always been there, hiding beneath the carpet. At its side, the runes connected to a pedestal which undoubtedly was where the warp charge would sit. We let you leave, unharmed and free. But you really have it. Norgrim asked. Smiley closed the door behind him, stepped away from Norgrim into a corner of the room and raised his hand, and with a sly smile, he made something appear, but it wasn't a warp charge. A shiny blue skull appeared in his hand. Smiley raised a brow and tilted his head to the side, surprised that Norgrim didn't try to snatch it away, as soon as it appeared but he sensed nothing. No mana and no tricks. Norgrim only raised a brow, confused for a moment, but knowingly nodded the next, understanding the level of mistrust that Smiley had for them it was zero. After stashing the skull away, Smiley made the warp charge appear, but only for a glimpse, which was enough to satisfy the headmaster. Norgrim's eyes lit up with a smile as he watched its red and blue energy dancing for a moment before it disappeared back into Smiley's inventory. In Smiley's possession was their hope, perhaps their only hope, of escape. Norgrim could have easily killed Smiley and taken it, if not for the unstable red energy on the boot. If the warp charge was dropped, it could respond and unleash more voids, killing the students, breaking the warp charge, and cracking their only portal in the process. Plus, it would look bad if other students had to walk past his corpse before entering the portal, perhaps they would defect, many didn't feel safe around the other students even before the event. Unfortunately, there was no sign of the love magic succubus student who enchanted Smiley the first time he arrived there, so his only tool was a promise, and the price to pay for the charge was small. I'll grant you your freedom, and I promise no harm will come to you. And rest assured, since the mirror reality is crumbling, there's no need to kill you. They won't be able to trace your mana signature back here if here doesn't exist, so it's fine. Norgrim said with a nod. Smiley nodded, but didn't relax his tense muscles. Lies always sounded the best when you wanted to believe them. The door opened and Evelyn rushed in with Sylvia. Hello. Ready for another operation. Sylvia grinned. She seemed to be the only person enjoying this. Smiley glared back at the short girl for a moment, then pointed at Norgram and Evelyn. You two leave. No one enters until Sylvia exits again. Evelyn was about to raise her finger in disapproval, but Norgram put a gentle hand on her shoulder, pointed to the door, and they both left without a word. Get this over with. And do it quickly unless you want the reality to collapse first. Smiley said coldly, took off his temple robe and leaned over the table as he bit down on the flashy robe, uncaring if his gnashing teeth would damage it or not. It shouldn't take long. Try to relax. Sylvia shrugged and trailed her delicate fingers on the back of his neck, interacting with her hateful creation. First it started with a grunt of pain, but screaming shortly followed. Outside the office, Norgram put his hands in his pockets and gave up a wry smile as the students looked on in fear, and he wondered if this was much better than passing a dead body on their way to freedom. The bug unlatched itself from the nerves in Smiley's spinal cord and burrowed its way out through the spinal column. His body trembled with pain and his head swirled in agony. Fingernails ripped out as his hands tightly gripped the desk, left in the wood as a memento. The agony caused his eyes to roll back into his head, and time seemed to stretch into eternity, but only minutes passed. Smiley didn't pass out this time, though his arms still trembled as he pushed himself off the desk and took some slow deep breaths. 
it's done, Sylvia said, and showed him the bug. Hello. She tapped his shoulder with a smile. Meet your little friend. In Sylvia's messed up mind, she thought after spending so much time with the bug, he would have befriended it. Though nothing could be further from the truth. Smiley slowly opened his eyes, strings of spit trailing from his mouth. He stepped closer and slowly reached out, gently placing his hand under hers. Hello. He whispered, wrapping his fingers under hers. Crunch. He clenched her hand, stopping her from pulling it away. But Smiley wasn't satisfied. He brought his other hand down in a fist, slamming it into hers, and sending a splatter of green everywhere. Hey, you asshole. Sylvia yelled, gritting her teeth. Smiley took a deep breath and smiled as his body recovered. You would have done the same thing. He whispered. Sylvia frowned as she held a pile of goo in her hand. She took a moment to wipe it on the wall and went to the door. Wait. Smiley said, stopping her from opening it. What? You want another friend? Watch this. Smiley said, hoping she would be intrigued enough to keep the door shut. The warp charge appeared and placed it on the pedestal. A trail of runes lit up, traveling down the side and lighting up the circle on the floor. The runes began to spin round each other, as a single point of nothingness cracked open into a crackling portal. Norgrim sensed the mana, and the door to the room opened as soon as the portal did. Thankfully Sylvia was in front of it, giving Smiley just enough time to give up a disdainful grin. Wait. There's something on your... Norgrim yelled. But it was too late. Smiley's only bargaining chip was out, sitting on the pedestal and ready to be plucked away by whoever wanted it, so he slipped through before Norgrim could finish his sentence. Chapter 370. My Responsibility. The room fell silent. Slivia stared at the portal, then at Norgrim. Norgrim's mouth fell open in shock no, maybe in defeat. He looked so lost in that moment, but his eyes remained fixed to the portal. You bastard. You little bastard. He faintly whispered. The portal began to change. It turned from blue to a deeper shade of purple, tainted by the chaotic energy on Smiley's boot. What's the matter? Sylvia said, but Norgrim was murmuring to himself. Blue, normal. Green, time reverse. Yellow, age reverse. Orange, locationless. Red, forward purple what the hell is purple? Blue and red. Norgrim scratched his chin, rambling quietly to himself. Just wait outside, dear. Evelyn said. Sylvia shrugged and left the room. She had experiments to finish and gather up. Evelyn closed the door, so. It's purple. It will send us into the future. Not too far, hopefully. Norgrim said, frowning, but we will lose so much time. All the students we could have gathered. The mage hunters will have new technology. I can't. It's too much. Norgrim began to massage his temples, closing his eyes into hopeless grief. But Evelyn wouldn't let him wallow in it. Stop that. You have a responsibility to these students. We need to leave. Purple, blue, green, it doesn't matter. That's our way out, and we'll take it. And we'll need you on the other side. She said. M.M. Norgrim said, slowly opening his eyes and nodding. He hadn't only lost his academy, but the entire mere reality in a single day. Not to mention all the loyal staff and teachers who had become like a family to him over the years. Then there was also the village living in the mere reality, the natives, those who weren't students but had no desire to fight. He couldn't protect them, and there was no way they were making it to the academy. But he took a deep breath and compassed himself. Sorry. Let's get to safety. The students come first. He said, marched out into the hallway and mobilized the students, guiding them all into his office and through the portal. Sylvia was the last student to pass by Norgrim, but she was the only one with a smile. Don't worry. You said I couldn't harm him, but you said nothing about racking him. Sylvia winked, and both Evelyn and Norgrim gave up a soft laugh, as the woman both went into the portal, leaving Norgrim as the last soul to enter. But he paused. He stepped away from the portal and approached his window, giving one last longing look across his beloved academy, and stroked his fingers across the windowsill. For a moment he wondered if he should leave. They wouldn't know if he decided to stay or if he got caught here, and understood why captains went down with their ships it was love. It was a part of them that couldn't just be ripped out. But he sighed and shook his head. The students were part of it too, and his duty to them was not over. My responsibility. He murmured. It was hard to turn away from the window, each step to the portal fell so slow and sluggish. But he compassed himself, and with a final sigh, entered the purple portal. Great wall of fog, rocky plain, ASTRATA. 
three bounty hunters along with Lara and Lannister, stopped at the edge of a thick fog. The thick grey curtain stretched into the skies and loomed over them like a fortified wall. Esther looked over to the other group, it's that way. She pointed into the fog. Link glanced over too, locking eyes with Lara. There was still some tension, but they both kept quiet. We don't sense anything. Let's keep moving, Lannister said. The separate groups passed into the thick mist. The edge was like a thick membrane, blocking any vision from outside. The humid air made each of their eyes squint, and Esther coughed for a few moments. Stay closer together. Lannister called, and the groups moved nearer until they could see each other's shadowy silhouettes. Link didn't like being closer to them, and kept his eyes peering towards Lara. The suspicion between them was still strong, but he didn't think the other group members could sense it. Link was suspicious of Lannister too, but couldn't read him or his intentions, even after they walked for hours over the rocky moss-covered plain. He seemed as agreeable as Esther, and perhaps more innocent. Each step Lannister took seemed like a child walking through a garden, his eyes filled with wonder as he looked over the deep forests and lofty mountains. When he saw the smallest of the most insignificant flowers that were not even blooming, he would crouch down and take a closer look, and his awe and wonder renewed with each footprint he left behind. Yet Lannister wasn't lost in his own world, he was always the one to talk and urge them forward, guiding them under Lara's watchful eye, who was always not at an agreement with him. Their connection even caused a string of jealousy to stir in Link, and he wondered if he would ever have that trust with Vanderby and Estra, but after what happened during the last fight, he doubted it, they hadn't even checked if he was injured from that giant bug. Esther whispered, we're getting close. But the quietness was short-lived. Down. Lara called. A blazing ball of flames waved past, hissing through the air, passing between both groups. A dim illumination appeared in the fog. Only one orange glow, then more shifting lights appeared, spreading wider like they were guarding a wall. They're trying to separate us. Someone said. Another fireball came, then another. One nearly missed Estra, and another lit Vanderby's shield as it passed by, hissing through the air. This chapter was first shared on the NEO of the Euros LS set 1N platform. Blink. Vanderby called. Not yet. Link sternly replied, hoping the others would keep their cool. He glanced at the silhouette of Lara and Lannister between barrages of fireballs. The two strangers were like shadows in the fog, and moved fast. A blazing ball shot towards them, which they dodged but Link wanted to see what they could truly do, so he stalled as long as possible. After the barrage of fire got heavier, he finally saw something new. A flash of blue light appeared as quickly as the fireball came, then disappeared in the blink of an eye. As for the fireball, it also disappeared. So I'm not the only one hiding something. Link thought, and dodged more of them whizzing past. Damn it Link can you just do it? Esther murmured, trying to hide behind Vanderby. It wasn't just Lara and Lannister who were feeling the brunt of the assault. Wanted only when I'm needed. Link thought, his eyes narrowing into a disdainful stare that landed on the back of Esther's head. Just a little bit longer, Link said. He heard a whistle of rushing air resounded as large head-sized stones shot into the fog. Lara was attacking with her earth magic. The illuminating lights responded, breaking apart and spreading out further to escape the high-speed stones, and the barrage of fireballs intensified with a vengeance. Vanderby crouched lower, hiding behind his shield which he pushed into the dirt, with Estra hugging behind him. Fireballs burst across it, and searing flames washed over the sides, barely sparing their skin from the heat. The shield was heating up. Link had high agility, enough to dodge them for now, but he wasn't sure how long they could last behind that shield, especially since the lights were gradually moving to their flanks. GRH. A grunt resounded from the silhouettes, causing Link to smile. Lara was hit. Guiding a large number of stones to chase her targets, had sapped her concentration. She was dodging them, but it was too much for her to handle. More of the blue light flashed around them, but Link couldn't tell exactly what it did. The fireball simply disappeared whenever it made contact, a peculiar skill, which he guessed was one of Lannister's defensive ones. With high dexterity, dodging the bright fireballs was easy enough, though if there weren't other human targets to draw some of the attacks away, Link doubted he would last long. However, in the thick fog, more lights were appearing. Lara's stones cleared a few away, but it wasn't enough. They appeared faster than she could kill them. Blink had to act but the longer he waited, the more enemies he could take out in one flash of his sword. However if more appeared, he would be a sitting duck. His flash step was his only skill after all, and came with a long cooldown. When the fireballs soaring through the fog began to sound like an endless screech, he decided it was time. 
he took a deep breath and pushed his sword out by a thumb's length. Lower your heads. And make sure you call out to me afterwards so I can find my way back to you. Link whispered, gripping his sword tightly. They were already lowering their heads and cowering behind the heavy shield like helpless children, so he merely said it to keep them quiet. Wait, what about the others? Esther said. I'll tell them. Link said, dashing toward Lara. Esther frowned, but another fireball flew past. She tucked her head down and huddled closer to Vanderbee, hoping to get closer behind his battered shield. Link dodged balls of fire and flames on the ground, which were effortlessly burning even in the damp dirt. Something about the flames caused his danger sense to heighten, but against his own intuition he continued. Link was about to get a closer look at that blue skill, and if Lara showed in signs of aggression, he would use his own secret weapon before they knew about it. If it was a harmless skill and Lara didn't threaten him, then he would urge them to lower their heads and use his flash step. However, just before calling out, the darkened landscape began to brighten. At the beginning of the fight, the sun was like a dim white circle, barely visible as it hung above, but miraculously the fog thinned with little warning, and the sun shone through in full radiance. The first shafts on sunlight began to kiss the ground, which had missed its warm light for quite some time. Without warning and without wind, the fog was clearing, disappearing as if it were an illusion, and Link paused as he waited to see those strangers' skills more clearly. Chapter 371 Strangers The barrage of fireballs stopped as the sky opened up. Even the flame-like creatures paused their attack to see what was going on. The landscape finally revealed itself, uncovered from the gloomy darkness. It was as bare and desolate as one would assume, though even here there were signs of life. Darkened mud, thorny plants, and many little creatures skittered around to find shelter in the shadows of anything they could. White bark trees stood separately, each dead or dying, and each worse than the last. At the tops of each of tree was a smoldering ember, slightly smoking. All of them like candles that had been blown out. As for the fire-like entities that dwelled at their tops, they had abandoned their resting places. Each of the fire lights burned hotter, enlivened after the sunlight gleamed through. It was a sign of freedom from the fog, and now that all the shadows were clear, it was easy to see their targets. Without any fog to hold them back, they descended on the adventurers with renewed fury. But their anger wasn't filled with revenge, this was a celebration of the breach of their foggy prison. Blink's eyes widened as he saw the flames clearly. There was faces in them, all of them grinning with malevolence. His sword gripped heightened, but he still hadn't used his flash step skill. Hold. We can take them. Lara called, but her voice was strained. Link could tell she had been injured, and by the sounds of her voice, her battle against her pain was more intense than this one. But the situation was getting worse. More and more fireballs whizzed past, more accurate than before, faster, hotter. Other flaming creatures saw the battle from a distance and joined in on the celebration. Link strained every muscle to sidestep three of them, duck under another, and press his body to the ground to escape many more. Each ball of flame was scarcely dodged, and each of Link's hairs curled, cinched from the heat. The area he dodged in was coated in wailing flames, and the space he had to move in was constricting. Despite the pressure, Link moved closer to Lara and Lannister. Finally he saw their ability. A blue ring flashed into existence as it swallowed a fireball and disappeared. He guessed it was a type of defensive portal or some kind of absorbing shield magic. He couldn't be sure, but either way, the blue ring took a moment to form, and he reasoned that it wouldn't be useful against his own secret skill. GRRH. Lara gritted her teeth as more flames coated her side, burning and melting the leather and flesh together, before they each dripped off her body. But she held on, knowing that pain was temporary. Lara guided floating rocks across the battlefield with deafening speed, each of them whistling through the wind faster than the balls of flame. Each rock passed through the firelights and caught a light, leaving gaping holes in their elemental forms. But it wasn't always a kill. Some of the flame entities perished, and others reformed. There was a weak point, but whatever it was, was not always hit. However the numbers getting slain were still not enough, even if she could clearly see the targets. What started as a small line of them turned into an engulfing wave of fire that was about to engulf them. Link already knew it was not something they could win, even with his hidden ability. He glanced over to Vanderby and Esther. Each of them were still huddled behind the shield, expecting him to handle it. But why was it always him? Couldn't they do anything useful? As he stood alone between the two groups, he realized he didn't need them. Perhaps he never did, and his opinion of them turned sour. Pathetic. Link thought. He was glad to see that at the very least, Esther had readied her bow, but she hadn't even knocked an arrow to fire. 
not that it would help. If Lara, who effortlessly crushed the giant bug, had trouble killing them with her high-speed stones, trying to kill them with arrows was akin to insanity. The realization dawned on Link. They were all out of place here, out of their depths. They should have never left the bosom of the city streets, where each alleyway sheltered them or provided their next opportunity. But their naivety and greed had made fools of them all. Link was close enough to hear Lara's huffs and groans as she fought against the pain and enemies alike. He had never seen such resoluteness confined in a single person. She dodged as best she could but wasn't fast enough. The firelights prioritized her, the only one standing and attacking them, and other than Lannister's portal, Lara had no real defense but, it was better than Vanderby who didn't even raise his shield to protect them all. But Link didn't use his skill. He suddenly felt threat grip his heart and clutch it, and it all came from Lara. Link stepped back as he heard her words, and a sense of coldness creep up his spine, breathing on his neck. Plan, plan B. Lara whispered, pushing out the words just a little too loudly. The blue portal flashed open again, but this time it didn't close as they stood behind it. Lara finally dropped her hands and gave up the attacks against the firelights. She turned and stared at Link with the same look she had after the giant skittering creature died, a hunter eyeing its prey. Her eyes were empty. Detached as cold and mechanical as the bug she'd slain. Link leapt further backwards, his hands still tight on his sword. He pushed his senses to their limits and scanned the rocks, looking for any sign of movement. He knew she was an earth a rock mana crafter of some sort, so the threats would come from those. Crunch. G.H. Ga. Esther screamed. Link spun his head back to the others. Vanderby's shield collapsed to the ground. Blood flowed after the sickening crunch. His hands poking from the, the shield were limp, his body flattened. But there was no rock atop it. It had simply drove down into his body. Blink took in a quick cold breath as he watched Esther scream. More fireballs hurtled towards her, and without the shield she would be nothing but ashes. Yet before flames could touch her body, she was pulled from the ground and floated over to Lara, her limbs flailing from the speed. Lara fixed her eyes on Link, but instead of crushing him, she raised a brow. He had taken his hand off his sword. It was a sign that he admitted defeat, one she knew well, and decided to give him a swift death. She raised her hand to crush him under his own weight, but before she could lower it, he disappeared. F-S-H-R-E-W. A gasp of whispering wind sounded. Link vanished. Little did Lara know, Link had a single ability. With his grip on a weapon, he dashed through battlefields like a shooting star, cutting enemies down in one swing. But without a weapon, he disappeared in the blink of an eye, leaving nothing but a whisper of wind behind. Invisibility or not, Lara wasn't worried. She had an invisible wall of crushing gravity raised around her. If this was a sneak attack, he would die shortly. But after a few moments, nothing happened. Your friend is pretty smart, Lannister said, holding Esther in his arms. She tried to push herself out, but was no match for his higher level strength. All she could do was cry and weakly beat her fists against him, even as more fireballs whizzed past the edges of the portal. Quick. Lara said, trying to hold her side as she bent over in pain. It was for the mission. I already told you I won't fail again. Give me some time to heal. Another portal formed behind them, and with their captive they stepped through. On the other side a gentle breeze greeted them. The sounds of hissing fireballs disappeared, replaced by a sweet silence and an aroma of flowering plants. A nearby mountain was as good of a place as any, and from there they could see the swarm of firelights crashing onto Vanderby's corpse, leaving it as a blazing fire. The portal snapped closed before any invisible threats could come through. Lara gritted her teeth, held her breath and scanned the surroundings, but sensing nothing, she collapsed to her knees and fell backwards. This chapter was first shared on the NEOV Euros LS set 1N platform. Ugh. She weakly groaned. Lannister raised a brow, you pushed yourself too far again. It was for the mission. I already told you I won't fail again. Give me some time to heal. Esther remained silent, too fearful to speak. Lannister put her down and she curled her arms around her knees, but her teary eyes watched every movement of her captors, expecting a flick of Lara's wrist and sealing her life at any moment. Chapter 372 Eyes Closed How long do you need? Lannister said. Ten minutes had passed since they arrived in the lonesome field of flowers, a small respite atop the mountain. A sheer drop was on one side, and a rugged climb on the other. I don't know. I got hit pretty bad. It still hurts. Lara weakly moaned, trying to hide her pain. All right, just let me know. He smiled, and began to trace his fingers across the flower petals, and watch bees hopping between them. 
Lannister didn't mind the detour. They needed to wait a few days before returning to the mere reality anyway, so he began doing what he enjoyed the most marveling at the world and the riches it offered. Esther quietly watched him, unwilling to break the silence. She sat amidst the flowers and hoped they would forget about her, but that was just a desperate, hopeless, maddened wish. Yet it was one she clung onto as she watched how carefree Lannister was. Lannister walked around the flowers, curiously looking at whatever he found. He reminded Esther of a child, captivated by the smallest things, and for a moment she wondered if he would even find a pair of sticks to toy with. But as his captive, she hoped it didn't come to that, as sticks always led to stones, which begged for targets to be thrown at. Lannister's trail through the flowers was more chaotic than the bees, turning, twisting and crossing itself. But every so often he lifted his head and called to Lara. Are you ready now? He asked, and Lara would reply without any sense of annoyance in her voice. I need more time it still hurts. No. No. Not yet. Lannister never seemed to get bored, and Esther wondered if anything could break his spirit. And then, she saw something in him change. As he twirled the flower in his hand he abruptly froze, tossed the flower away and dashed over to Lara. His carefree expression disappeared, his eyes intense and single-minded, wholly focused on Lara as he crouched at her side. What's wrong? Are you okay? Really okay? Lara. He blurted. Ezra stood up and watched, holding her breath. Something was wrong, very wrong. She glanced across the mountain, wondering if she should make a run for it or if she could even survive out there. They hadn't taken away her weapons, so there was a chance. But she couldn't bring herself to leave, not after witnessing how easily and quickly Vanderby was crushed. Lara groaned, her eyelids barely open as she weakly raised her hand, something's wrong. I need the infirmary. Say no more. Lannister jumped up and golden runes appeared in his hands. He laid them a few feet above the flowers in a floating circle, and using magic, he created an elaborate mesh, connecting them at various points across the circle, as he crafted the stage for his portal above the flowers. Lara continued to groan and weakly held her side. She was holding on well before, but now she looked horrible. Her skin turned white, her eyes sunken, and it seemed that her HP had dropped to zero. The real damage to her body had begun. Blood continued to flow as charred burning marks continued to eat whatever flesh attempted to reform for a final time. Esther watched the portal runes being laid, it was so complicated and confusing that she had to blink and shake her head a few times. She simply couldn't make sense of it. Some runes were large, as big as wagon wheels, while others were the size of marbles, and yet they all had a role to play within the portal architecture. Get ready to move. Lannister called, and the circular stage of runes began to gleam with a blinding light. He didn't give a single thought to how this would affect the mere reality. Above the runes a swirling point of nothingness materialized. Blue crackling energy began to swirl and try to pull it open. No no no. Come on, it was perfect. Lannister said, sounding panic for the first time. But he stepped back slowly. Something's wrong. He whispered, dropping his hands to the side. The swirling crackling blue energy intensified, trying to rip open a rift. Arcs of chaotic energy leapt from the portal, frustrated and furious that they couldn't tear open the portal. Lannister turned and bolted towards Lara, jumping on her body and covering her. Esther's hairs raised on end as she fell danger, and she also hit the ground as quickly as she could. A deafening crack sounded as blue light flared, sending a bright flash over the entire mountain. Stray tendrils of energy hissed as they lashed out like thick lightning bolts. Everything they touched vanished. The golden runes underneath the portal withered, their glow softened and then disappearing into nothing. Boom. A deafening roar tore open eardrums. The mountain shook and the field cracked open. The portal expanded and collapsed on itself, pulsing with a wave of heat that turned the flowers brown. The pulse of energy had nearly knocked Esther unconscious, but she didn't dare to lift her head until the shaking stopped. She found her hands clutching, digging into the earth. After a short while her HP healed her eardrums, and she still heard echoes of the boom, still bouncing between the mountains. If other bounty hunters searching for Jay wanted a clue, they had just received it. This chapter was first shared on the NEO of the Euros LS set 1N platform. Esther finally pushed herself from the ground and blinked to cure her fuzzy vision, and examined the damage. A perfectly spherical crater was left in the earth where the portal was. A little further away boulders rolled down with deep thuds. But this wasn't the only change. Streaks of black lightning appeared in the sky, ripping through it and freezing in place. Something felt wrong, like her very soul was being threatened. And then she saw the source of her existential terror. 
Further down the mountain, in the swamp they had escaped from, a spire of black nothingness appeared, like a torn piece of a starless night, breaking out of the earth. It was as tall as the mountain itself, stretching into the sky. The tendrils of frozen black lightning spread from the top of the spire like a gray tree, casting that old swamp in shadows once more. The fire lights that had escaped their foggy prison had dashed out across the rocky plain, but now they changed direction they all had turned back and sped towards the spire. What what is happening? Esther whispered. Across the horizon and throughout the land, more of the black spires appeared, each standing proudly and shooting their own tendrils into the sky, daring all to approach their splendor, and each gave off a feeling of dread that made her chest feel hollow. Now, she doubted any bounty hunters would come their way. Esther looked around for help, for anything or anyone to make sense of it but Lannister's eyes were fixed on Lara. He only had one concern, even if the world was filled with those terrible black spires. Lara, I couldn't connect. I failed. Something's wrong, I donned. I don't I couldn't Lannister shook his head as his eyes began watering. SHH, don't cry. It's okay. This is the life we chose. She placed her palm on his cheek, just let me see your smile. She said with a gentle voice, but Lannister was lost in thought. If we go to a city, maybe we could get you healed. Just hold on. Lannister said, and a portal formed behind him, but as he grabbed Lara's arm she felt heavy, too heavy to lift. Stop. Lara whispered. Why? Just let me. You can be healed. He tried to pull her up again, but she resisted. Lara weakly blinked her eyes and titled her head to look him in his eyes. Her gaze was filled with a tenderness that was new, but familiar to Lannister, one that could melt any heart with its warmth. Behind her hard exterior and tempered attitude, a soft soul stepped forward. I won't let you put yourself in harm's way. Not for me. She said. Lannister grit his teeth and fought back his tears, but it became harder each time Lara spoke. I don't want to die. I don't want to leave you behind. She took a strained breath. Please forgive me. For all the times I hurt you. Lannister took a deep breath, fighting his tears away. You never hurt me. You healed me. Lara smiled and stroked his cheek, and something appeared from her inventory. A small book. You opened my eyes. Never close yours. Lara weakly murmured and held the book up. It was a journal, filled with sketches of flowers, bugs, mountains and waterfalls, the journal Lannister had forgotten, taken from him when he entered the mirror reality and lost his memories all those years ago. Lannister grabbed the book from her shaky hand, and her hand fell down as soon as he took it. Under Lara's loving gaze, Lannister looked through some of the pages. The images seemed to call out to him, but Lara was more important. To Lannister, the beauty in Lara's soft eyes could never compare to a thousand of the drawings in the journal. He wanted their silence to last forever, but the rising of her chest slowed, her grip on his hand lost its strength. Her smile softened and waned. Her eyes, which were locked with his, became empty. Lannister froze, not daring to take a single breath, keeping his eyes locked onto hers as he felt his heart rend and sink. He didn't want to move. He wished time would stand still, but his vision clouded with tears. He spent his time looking at the wonders of life, the movements of bugs and beautiful trees, but now, he was confronted with death. His hands trembled as an unstoppable tidal wave of grief crashed down and swallowed him whole, and he had nothing to brace against it. Chapter 373 Reach The birth of this content finds its genesis in N.O.V. Euros L.S.Z.N. Bob. Hello. Azra poked his cheek. It had been a few minutes since he passed out, and still hadn't woken up. After a few more pokes Azra frowned, wondering why he was in such a rush, but now he was basically sleeping. Surely sleeping wasn't his top priority. Nevertheless, her pokes became more relentless. But a tension filled the air. The throne shifted, and Azra stepped back from Jay as the skeletons all went on guard. She froze, wondering if she had crossed a line with all her poking but, they pointed their swords towards Hagatha's shack. Azra raised a brow, equally wondering what had put the skeletons on high alert, and glad that her pokes hadn't made her an enemy of the undead. However, she wasn't going to wait around and find out. Bob, we need to move. Azra pinched his hand, but froze again, stepping backwards from Jay, though it wasn't the skeletons causing her to pause her assault on his skin. The shadowy swamp became brighter. Across the swamp, a shaft of sunlight light gleamed, unimpeded by the fog and shimmering on the water. Azra's eyes widened as more light broke through. She jumped over to the blanket, wrapping it tightly around her body and covering her head, just before a gleam of light landed on the throne. The gloomy darkness disappeared completely, and the suffocating thick fog gave way to a less suffocating stale air. 
what did you do? Azra murmured, but the skeletons holding the throne suddenly shifted, pointing the throne directly toward the old rotting shack. The skeletons didn't like it either. Again the throne shifted as a deep boom resounded through the earth, and a light appeared from the soil, a wave of red energy surged up through the dirt. The red energy carried its own killing intent, and the sight of it caused a cold fear to trail over Azra's skin. There was something sinister in the energy, more than killing intent, but emotions of hunger and authority. Even as a vampire she felt its chill. Azra responded instantly, her natural instincts to hide from sunlight, moved her muscles on its own, and closed herself within the noon leather blanket. The magic blocking material was the best place she could possibly be. But to her own surprise, there was another instinct to play which drove her closer to Jay, the one who protected her all this time. She wouldn't let it harm him either. The thick light passed harmlessly over the skeletons, and as it went around the noon leather, it warped like a bubble being squished from one side as it wrapped around. Its presence was suffocating, and she felt like it wanted to cut her off from the world completely, detaching all things and leaving her forever alone. She was close enough to Jay to protect his body, but even after this he didn't awaken. The throne shifted again, but this time, it wasn't because of the skeletons. A shudder spread through the floating island, sending ripples and smaller waves that stirred up the swamp. As the red energy spread through the swamp all sorts of creatures left their mud burrows and fled. Waves of larger slumbering monsters sped through the waters, all of them ignoring their painful hunger, as they made every effort to get away, sliding and clambering over one another. Carnivorous plants curled up and closed their hatches, poisonous flowers and leaves closed and fell off. For once, their next meal was not their top priority. Every instinct was telling them to flee. Azra's face was cloaked in the blanket. The red wave had passed, but it wasn't the end. If anything, it was just a taste. An even stronger overwhelming pressure pushed on her back, cold and sinister as it wrapped itself across her body more tightly than the blanket, and sank deep into her inner being. Its terror felt like a rope around her neck, inching itself tighter with each passing second. She sank to her knees, her hands trembling. She didn't know what to do, what she could do against a threat she couldn't even see. She fought her body to take the slightest peek, but she couldn't bear to turn around. Every sense and muscle in her body was telling her to curl up into a ball and die certainly not to look back. But against all emotions, she logically made plans, and put them into action, step by herring step. She took out the blood compass and peered into its smooth surface, using it like a mirror to catch a glimpse, and she dropped it as soon as she caught sight of it. A spire of nothing. It wasn't merely a black shadow, it was void. All-consuming, empty and endless. And she could feel its hunger. It wanted her to be a part of it, to marvel at its endless majesty. Azra snapped her head down and clutched her body, trying to make herself as small as she could. She didn't want to utter a word, but the skeletons didn't move. The throne didn't even shake the skeletons' sense threat, but not fear. They were as happy being here as anywhere else. Azra found it hard to breathe in its presence, but against her own sanity, she called out from the blanket. We she took a deep breath, need to move. She whispered, but the skeletons didn't respond. Azra peeked up at Jay. Still passed out, though his hair stood on end. The island tilted, and the shoreline moved closer. It's sinking. Red, if you don't want Bob to drown we have to move. She said. Red's neck creaked as it surveyed their surroundings. Jay had made Azra their navigator after all. Blue's bones began to twist and creak too as the skeletons had a silent dialogue. The water crept upwards and reached the feet of the skeletons. Logic was on Azra's side, and it seemed that the skeletons were at least sensitive to that. The island's sinking. He'll die if we don't leave. Azra repeated, her voice filled with desperation as she called from within the blanket. Finally the sweetest sound she'd ever heard came to her ears. The bones of all the skeletons began to rattle. They accepted my order. She thought, quietly breathing a sigh of relief as the throne turned, wobbled, and began a swift march to the bone bridge Jay had laid down. Azra's body still trembled. She couldn't bear to peek out from under the blanket. The fear radiating from the black spire was still pressing on her, and leaving its presence felt like she was in defiance of a king, as if she'd spit on a royal's face, while their guards held their swords at her neck. Even if the sunlight was burning her to ashes, she doubted she would be able to move, and could only rely on Jay's skeletons. After crossing the bridge, she finally lifted herself and huddled near Jay's legs, a hand on his knee. Bob, wake up. By my hold, I commanded. She said, and her vampiric eyes glowed. But Jay's eyes remained closed. Tears began to well in her eyes, though she didn't know why. 
He was just a husk, a useful tool. Her captive in food. How could he be anything more than that? But she wanted nothing more than for him to awaken. He hadn't just been all those things, he had been more. Not once did he fear her, and even talk to her casually as an equal. It was oddly refreshing. Please. As her whispered. Jay's consciousness was lost, his mind separated. Endless darkness engulfed him. He looked down to see that he had no body or hands, then wondered which way down was. He no longer felt a connection to his body, or to the world. Yet something about the detachment was so freeing. He knew he had to escape, but he wondered if he wanted to return at all. There was little desire to do anything but rest there, wherever there was. All he had was his thoughts, painful thoughts of struggle and loneliness, but the emotions from them were dulled and already disappearing. But something else became more tangible, something holding his very soul, a strength that lay deeper. The words of the immortal book were with him, inscribed on his inner being and holding on to him, keeping his mind in a sense of peace, and perhaps, even love. How could words love him? It was odd, but he accepted them. They were a shield against the emptiness, a refreshing river overflowing with cooling waters, a light that could not be hidden as they hemmed in his form, stopping it from dissipating into nothingness. Woes of comfort, escaping the circles, satisfaction and wisdom, rejecting truth for an endless maze of lies. There dwells a monster living in all of us, and to live we walk the endless dance between chaos and order. Jay thought, remembering each lesson. He realized that once he left his body, these lessons had become his only possessions, and now, his only treasures, guarding his soul. He knew some of them urged him to continue, but ultimately it was his choice. Jay and Lannister were both lost. One in a void of darkness, the other in grief, though there was little difference. Each was as empty as the other, and nothing the world offered could satisfy the endless void they both felt. All the prodding from Azra wouldn't bring Jay back, and all the gentle nudges from Esther wouldn't be felt by Lannister. Even though she was at his side, they were worlds apart. But even in the darkness of grief, if only one would only look up and open their eyes to search, there remains a flicker of hope, a faint glimmer of warm light calling us home. Do we dare follow it? End of book O.N.E. Hi guys, humble a doer here, thank you so much for listening.